and welcome back. Now this week I thought I'd just go through a few things of what I'm doing when I construct a project like this. Obviously there are some steps to take and um, unless you've been like formally trained how to build a project I guess it can seem a little bit overwhelming and believe me they don't tell you stuff like this not even in university. They might tell you the theory of the electronics but when it comes to actually prototyping a unit like this hmm that's that's all down to experience, I think, and whatever the, the company does. So I thought I'd go through a few steps on how I approach this and why I've made certain decisions. If making a PCB is a bit of a puzzle to you, let JLC PCB help you put all the pieces in the right place. Easy EDA is an intuitive electronic design tool, just as I'm showing you here. And when you've done that, you can convert it into a PCB like this one here. And you can view it in 3D and see exactly how it's going to look before you order it. It's easy to order from JLC PCB directly from within EZDA with fast, reliable deliveries and now $2 for five pieces, including aluminium boards. They can even assemble them for you at no extra charge. Why don't you see what the JLC PCB can offer you today? Now, I've taken some feedback from you guys. Well, lots of feedback, actually. All the suggestions you made about why I should do certain things and other options I should consider and I've taken them all on board and decided what would work what wouldn't work and one of those suggestions was to put the the mains electric like the relay inside the heater case after all it sounds a lot safer doesn't it than keeping it outside let's see how that went so I've got the uh, the heater off the wall and I've taken off the back cover so if I lift this up we'll see the inners exposed and as you can see they're extremely simple indeed this is the the heater element down the bottom, both sides are here and here. Over here, that's the time clock that I don't use. That's the um, switching between one kilowatt and two kilowatts, and that's the bimetallic switch, which you might be able to see. I don't know how close I can get with the camera, but there's a little tiny contact right in there where my fat finger is there. You might see it switch. Just bring it around, you can hear it. Listen, I'll stop talking and you watch that uh, switch. Yeah, interesting. So uh, I'll be keeping that as a fail safe, even though I said I'd bypass it. What I mean is I'll just turn it up to something like, you know, 28 degrees or something, so that if whatever controls the heating element on here fails, at least that would give me some kind of uh, fail safe and, and keep it to a sensible temperature. Now, the bad news is, of course, is that although this seems to be one big, huge, empty box, um, the heater element is right down the bottom. And there's no way I can really fit in what would be an SSR anywhere down here in the cool. Worse than that is that I can't use this by itself. I've got to use it with a heat sink, which is over here. So that clamps onto there. And look how huge it is compared to a relay. I mean, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Now, this relay um, is from a reputable supplier and can switch 16 amps um, at 240 volts. Well, I need 8 amps, which is about the right rating. You know, you should always derate stuff by half. And this little tiny thing, well, that would mount in my mounting box, not necessarily in the side here, although I could, I suppose, mount this somewhere in here, because that doesn't necessarily have to be kept cool, and then the wires to here would all be low voltage, and all the main stuff kept within this area. Mm, seems a, a lot of work though for very little gain. But SSR versus relay, well you can see why you know you need a lot of space and I'd have to probably buy a kosher relay as well. I wouldn't use this fake one other than for testing purposes. And they're about 30 to 40 dollars. That's probably more than what the entire project's cost me so far. Ah, oh, what a great idea that was, though, to put stuff inside the case. And if this had been raised up, you know, to here, maybe I could have done something underneath where the cool air was. But as it stands, I don't think this is going to fly. Well, we gave it a shot and it was worthwhile doing. OK, back to the project then. So what are the steps I took in um, creating this? Step one. How do you know what enclosure and things you're going to fit all your components into? Well, for me, the first thing to do is get all the components. Unless you actually have them in front of you, there's no way on earth that you would know what it fits into and what it doesn't. And even when you get all the components, you then juggle things left, right and centre 
many, many times. Now you can see the enclosure I've got over here on the left hand side. You might be thinking, hang on, that looks slightly different to what you said last time, Ralph. Yes, and it is. Previously, I said I wanted to build this into a double mains patras or back box, namely something like this. So this is a standard UK back box, wall mounted, um, double socket, and there must be similar things in other parts of the world, because it would blend in, you know, it's domestic, isn't it? It doesn't look out of place. However, I quickly determined that the substance this is made of, I think it's urea formaldehyde or something, it's very brittle, very brittle indeed. And um, I mean, I've installed many of these in my previous workshop. And if you over tighten any of the mounting screws or don't knock, do the knockouts nice and gently, the whole thing will just crack. And I thought, hmm, this is going to be tricky because I need to drill a 20, mil 20 millimeter hole in the bottom here for my incoming mains. Then I thought, well, I probably want to put my standby temperature sensor through the case somehow. So I'd have to drill another hole there. And I thought, hmm, this, this is sounding a little bit tricky, but the, the killer was in the lid, I wanted to put a display. So this is the, the standard blanking plate that screws onto that, still in its lovely crinkly paper, which I'm not gonna take off because I'll lose the screws then. Um, and trying to drill anything into here, once again, is gonna be very difficult. You could probably grind it away, but even so. Uh, the display I want to put in is one of these, which is a 16 times two LCD display, which I've used a number of times in the past very easy to do mainly because there's this um, backpack i squared c device on the back so you can control everything on here via well two wires really plus power and it works very well it's the one i used in fact for benny's outside uh, rain sensor and things like that and uh, it's, it works very well i did have one fail once where the one i used out there was in fact a 20 by 4 so that's 20 columns long by four deep four rows deep and at the bottom two rows just suddenly decided to stop working so i had to replace that but this is 16 columns by two why do i want to have any kind of display well remember that this project is all about the temperature in my workshop and i thought well at the very least, I've got to display the temperature, what, what this unit thinks the temperature is anyway, so I know that it's working, and I can just glance at it easily. So I looked at seven segment LED displays, and big enough for me to see. I mean, I'm probably one, two and a half meters away from the, the wall in that direction. And uh, those little tiny half inch displays were going to be no good whatsoever. And then I thought, yes, I remember on Benny's um, outdoor sensor i used two lines to have big characters um, now the video that show there we are there's the there's the video that shows how i did the dual line display and i thought you know what i can't remember how i did it now well i can you know notionally understand the concept still but i think i'll just steal the code from what i wrote about five years ago and put it on here so i can have nice large digits to display the temperature plus other stuff that's going on yeah, I don't know what yet because I haven't designed the code, but you know, there's enough room on here to do a number of things. Now, to to put this cutout into a lid like this is beyond my capability. I just know it would crack at the last minute. You know, you just think you get in there and crack, and that'll be it done. So that meant that was absolutely no good whatsoever. I did discover though that you can get different blanking plates. Now these are from in the UK tool station and these are PVC. Look, you can you can sort of bend them. Yeah, and they are just like little bits of PVC, about three mil thick. Great for cutting. And I thought that would be the answer. I can then cut this properly and it won't crack, and I can put my display in there somewhere. It still remained the problem though, that the back box was gonna be tricky. But I bought some of these anyway for future projects. I thought, yeah, I, I like that idea. I do like the idea. So I've got those. Oh, you can get them in singles as well, by the way. There we are, that singles. Different manufacturer, by the way. Different manufacturer. Can't remember, what does that say? Profix. Yeah. And obviously, you'd probably use it that way so you didn't see any emblem on the front if it bothered you. But um, I've kept those in reserve for future projects. But I've decided I'm going to go with this box instead. Mainly because it's, well, PVC or plastic of some kind and is easy to drill. Um, for example, this 20 mil uh, 
conduit coupler that I drilled in here. Just just took a few seconds really with one of those tapered drills, and it's the same size pretty much as the standard patras that I was going to use. So it doesn't look out of place on the wall, especially not in my workshop. The lid for this, which is this one over here, also has a certain depth, which sort of almost hides the display, which is now mounted through there. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, cut this exactly square um, because I haven't got a CNC machine or anything. I had to do it by hand, but um, it'll have to do for this, have to do. So that's the project box I got having, and I knew that all these components here would fit into the original mains back box. So they're definitely going to fit into here. And with the extra depth, there was no problem with the screen fouling the components underneath, you know, touching. So how do I know then that all this is going to fit in here? And how do I place them? How do I place them? Well, basically, First of all, you should look onto the manufacturer's website to see if they can give you the dimensions of this, including all the mounting holes and stuff, because that's going to be critical, isn't it? Uh, unfortunately, um, there were none to be had. I couldn't find this anywhere. So I had to measure it, basically, using, well, a ruler or calipers for the actual width. Um, this box is too deep to enable me to measure the actual mounting holes using calipers, so I had to use a ruler. And then I created a mock-up PCB like this one here and uh, put it in there and as you can see it fits and the holes I simply used a drill um, and a screwdriver to get them all nicely centered and then measured them basically simple as that uh, obviously it's absolutely essential to take your time with this and get it spot on because otherwise your PCB will come back and it'll just be that little bit off which is still a concern to me now I mean for all I know it might be you know half a millimeter off here half a millimetre off here, and it's all a bit tight. So I've allowed extra space on the PCB, should I need to, to uh, drill those house, holes out a bit more, or ream them out a bit more. Apart from that, though, I think um, that's a, a fair representation of how it's going to be. Great. Then what? What's the next step in creating this project? Now, the very next thing I did was draw a circuit diagram. No, 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 no. Not this thing you're seeing in front of you. That, that's a result of several days' work. Just a rough and ready circuit diagram so that I knew I could connect various bits in. And the very first thing I thought I'd try was uh, connecting this transformer over here. And this is a dual transformer. Um, 5 volts, 12 volts, and of course AC mains in. Um, it's the little one on the, on the desktop. It's uh, this brown one here. Now, I looked long and hard at the specs for this and the reviews and where I was buying it from, a UK British firm. I think it was CPC at the end of the day, but they're part of the Farnell company. And if you can't trust them, who can you trust? So I'm thinking, OK, great. I'm going to wire this in first into that circuit diagram. And that's, that's where things really stopped, to be quite honest. First of all, try as I might, I couldn't find a schematic symbol for this transformer. So I thought, OK, I'll just create my own symbol then. That's fair enough. And then th that didn't really help either, because having created my symbol, making sure you get the pins around the right way, not that anybody would ever put them back to front, so I'm saying nothing. Anyway, having done that, that's OK for the circuit diagram itself, so you can get it connected up. But having done that bit, you think, great, now I'm going to switch over to the PCB design, at which point, of course, easy DA says, um, excuse me, I haven't got a footprint for that device. You're going to have to go and make one or attach one or something. So then you have to design a footprint. That's the actual physical implementation of this. Now, as you can see, when I drew this, I kept it pretty much as it looked like in real life. Yeah, so the pin arrangements... And there's a good reason for this. When you're creating um, a PCB from a schematic, you drew the schematic, the circuit diagram, in a particular logical way. Yeah. And when you create your PCB, I was always taught, create your PCB in a similar way. After all, you grouped certain components together on your schematic because they belong together, but logically connected and physically. Um, so make sure your PCB sort of reflects that. Don't just scatter them all over the place. Even if it, the circuit worked, you'll never understand why there's a resistor for a transistor over here. You know, it's not right. Is it? You've got to put the things closer together. 
So I've drawn this symbol pretty much how it looks physically, unlike if we look over here. If you see this um, ESP32D1 Mini, um, the pins seem to start out in some sort of logical order and then immediately go differently, yeah, because these are like logically grouped, not physically grouped, um, which which is which makes design a little bit more difficult because you're putting stuff on here and when you come to do the PCB, you discover that the pins you thought were next to each other are not and they're all scattered about. So, yeah, it's something to bear in mind, isn't it? So this device I had to create a footprint for. So if we go to library, that's that thing here, look up footprint. Uh, it's in my workspace because I created it. Um, what are we looking for? We're looking for that uh, transformer. It's this one here. So if I say edit, just to bring the thing up so we can all have a look. There it is. Ta-da! And it looks pretty much like it does in real life. And the pins and all that are numbered. These these pads here are numbered. That's number one. That's number five, I think. Yeah, number five. Exactly as it is per the, well, the manufacturer's diagram and what I put on my schematic. So now you have actually something physical to implement and you can actually put that on a PCB just to see how it looks. And, and it was a very, very iterative process. This did not come easily. In fact, I'm still doing it even as I'm recording this. So I'm, I've almost got to the end of the circuit diagram and PCB design, um, which I can show you briefly. Let me just have a look, go to projects. Um, and the reason I've done it this way is to keep all the main stuff over here. So from this sort of line here, that's AC mains, but everything this side, left-hand side, is low voltage, and everything right-hand side here is mains voltage. So it's obviously important to keep all that aside, and I thought, I don't want to electrocute myself here, so everything on here is going to be insulated. Now, lucky for me, there's only a few components that are actually connected to the live mains, 240 volts. So we have, um, well, the power supply, but only these two pins on the outside, so I can keep them sort of this way, okay, towards the AC side. There's the relay, which is doing all the switching on this side, but luckily the coil bits are further away. There's the snubber, that's um, a capacitor and a resistor in series that will be going across the contacts to stop any arcing. I won't fit that unless I discover there is arcing. There's a fuse holder here for that. I want that fused because that's um, obviously going to be a very low current requirement into here. But I want it fused. I'll put a 1 amp fuse in it. I could have gone lower probably, but I thought there might be some inrush current and eventually the fuse will fail, so I left it a 1 amp. This is the terminal connector for the wires coming in. Um, and it's the best that I could find, really. So it's a standard screw mount. Once you've screwed those in, the screws go down, of course. This bit is reasonably protected from above, and I'm not going to go and put my fingers in there uh, and touch those when it's on. And that's it. That's all the mains there is. So I'm going to keep that over onto the right-hand side of that board, all over here. So I'm going to be using three singles coming in, not the twin and earth type stuff. This is three single wires because I don't need an earth on here because this is all double insulated. There's no, where am I going to put an earth on here? There's no room for it. I haven't got any kind of metal contact with the outside world. So I'm going to have three singles come in down here where it says mains in, go through here. These gray things are in fact slots in the board. You can create a slot in the board by creating a track, right clicking it and say convert to cutout. So these are two millimeter wide, wide enough for a cable tie to go through just to hold them in place. And then they go to that um, screw connector at the top there. And uh, that's the snubber, if I choose to fit it. That's the relay, which I certainly will have to fit. No, it's not the relay. That's the, uh, what is that? Uh, that's the fuse holder. That's the relay over here. Admittedly, there is some low voltage stuff on the coil here, but I had to shuffle around and make some kind of... Um, compromise here but at least it's down the bottom and I'm going to be routing these wires manually you see that one there and that one there I don't know what's going through there that's the auto router because obviously easy EDA auto router has no idea that I'm dealing with live stuff and I want to keep the wires as far away from each other as I can so I'll be manually routing that wire and that wire there all down the bottom here well away from any of this main stuff up here so that'll be safe as well now, I discovered 
a while ago now, a way of keeping all the wires in routing away from holes. So these round things here are my holes. That's the grey thing. That's actually a three mil hole. But I didn't want these wires here like that going right next to it, which the router would do. So by putting a ring of track, both bottom, top and bottom, all right, just a circle and take the net name away. So there's no net. Um, it stops all the routing around these holes. As you can see, each one of these holes now has got a massive clearance around it. Should I need to make them just that little bit bigger because my measurements weren't 100% spot on. So that was another little interesting thing that um, I'm using. Yeah, okay, and apart from that, well, all the rest is, is low voltage. And what, I've, what have I got? What components have I got in the low voltage range? Now, some of these components have been added as part of your comments and feedback. Uh, for example, a PIR unit, this little one here, which I've used before in my mum's Home Alone project. It detects movement, so I'll be using one of those. The idea being, when this LCD is on displaying the temperature and perhaps anything else it needs to tell me, if there's no movement for a while, because I'm, I'm sat here hunched over the computer, not really moving, it will dim it. The LED on here, which is actually here and controlled by a by two little pins here, see this here. I'll take this jumper off and connect that pin there to a PWM transistor or MOSFET on my circuit board so I can dim the device down to sort of a, a barely readable level to, well, to save the LED really. It doesn't last forever, even though it's supposed to be many tens of thousands of hours, if not hundreds of thousands, it will eventually fail. So by dimming it, I'm hoping it will save it. But as soon as it detects movement, me moving about, it can go back to full brightness. That's one thing. Um, I've got two little LEDs here, red and a green. I did think about a dual LED, but I thought I haven't got the skills or the tools to make the hole in the lid directly line up with something on the PCB, which is how a commercial unit would do it. They just have standoffs on the PCB and the LED would, would line up exactly with an aperture in the lid. I thought I'm not going to do that. It's going to be off by half a millimetre or one millimetre and it's just going to look odd. So I've had these in my toolbox for about 30 years and uh, they're all chrome, very nice. They take about 13 milliamps each and I thought, well, a GPIO pin can produce that on an ESP32 and I'll drive these then via a 100 ohm resistor, uh, red being heaters on, green being standby mode and they can flash or do whatever they need to do to tell me when there's something wrong. And they can be screwed directly via a simple hole on the lid and it'll look quite smart. Certainly smarter than me misaligning uh, holes. And uh, well, this is low voltage as well, but that's on the lid as I showed you. Where's it gone over here? Um, at the moment, it's just roughly put together so I can get some sizings. These are plastic standoffs and things. Um, wasn't quite square, as I say, on here. And I'll, I'll try and tart this up a little bit. But I think it'll be okay for what it is. Now, I did finally, yes, decide upon this. Obviously, I've got one of these without all these big socket things on it. I'm adding an, an additional reset button on that circuit board because the reset button is over here. It's really, really difficult to do. And once that's on a circuit board, trying to press that is going to be difficult. And, of course, initially, I'll be programming it via the USB socket there rather than over the air, which will come into play. So my PCB takes that into account. So over here, I've left lots of room here so I can plug in an adapter for my USB, an up adapter, as they call it. So you plug it in and then it points upwards so you can plug in another USB into it. So I'm hoping there's enough room here. And there's my extra reset button, surface mount. And next to it is a two-way pin header because I'm thinking, do you know what? I possibly probably will require a reset pin on the front panel. Now I haven't, I do, it would just be a simple momentary push button. If I find that this does hang or I do need to press the old reset button every now and again, I will bring that out onto the front panel as well. It's no good doing all this after the fact, is it? You've got to think about these things ahead of time. I might need this and I might need that. You can always not fit it and not implement it. But if you haven't got it, hmm. So one of the things I haven't done yet, oh, that socket there incidentally is for the LCD. It just plugs in there. One thing I haven't done is brought out any spare GPIOs on these pins here somewhere on this board. 
normally I bring out as many spares as I can in case I need to increase the functionality in some way. And then you think, if only I had a spare GPI open, I could connect this and this and this. So I'm going to try and bring out at least a couple, but as I say, not hopefully on the outer layer of pins, because then I have to fit another set of headers on there. And um, well, it just gets more and more complicated, doesn't it, really? Uh, one thing I do bring out here, which uh, I'll zoom in on, is the TX, RX and ground, because once this is all running, I can connect the TX to a standard FTDI USB to serial interface and read the stuff that's coming out of the ESP32, exactly the same way as I do it in my ESP32 radio. Always good to have that. Then you don't need the USB socket connected up um, permanently, and I don't really want to do that because it's, it's going to put strain on this socket. So I'll use it for programming initially, but once it's in the case, I'm hoping that I'll have over-the-air working over the air software updates. Okay, well I think we're done today. If there are any comments and if anybody wants to do their due diligence on this design, I'll put this whole picture up on my uh, GitHub and you can have a look at it with the circuit diagram. Um, your feedbacks as a, as a peer review would be greatly appreciated because there's obviously any mistakes on there. It means it's wasted time and money, isn't it? Uh, what I don't really want is, you know, change your design because a lot of effort's gone into this already. I've already taken feedback on your suggestions on that. So I think the design itself is going to have to stay unless there's a fundamental reason why I shouldn't have it like this. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you say on that. And uh, yeah, I reckon with all the combined brains of the people in this video, we should better get something that actually works and implemented before the cold weather starts, which apparently is going to start next week. It's going to drop down to 18 degrees centigrade. There'll be frost on the ground before you know it. So keep tuned. Let's have your comments back. Give me a like if you like this video. Don't forget to subscribe and tick the bell. That's what YouTube tell me to tell you. Subscribe and tick the bell. Um, great stuff. Okay, look forward to seeing you. See you next week. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.